Today's project is a stupidly clever application of magnets. And to give credit where it's due, I got this idea from AVE's YouTube channel. I figure if you're watching my videos, you've probably seen at least one of his before, since he's a pretty big name when it comes to machining, welding, and that kind of stuff. But maybe uh, a week or two ago, he published a video showing him make one of these tool demagnetizing tools. And his was done with a big old hunk of aluminum that he turned down on his big ass lathe and then drilled out on the clapped out bridge port and then dropped some magnets in. And overall, it seemed like a pretty big project with a lot of big machinery that I don't have. Uh, I do have a lathe, a broken lathe, for what that's worth, uh, zero. But even if I had, you know, the machinery he had, I'm not sure I'd want to spend that much time for what was really a kind of simple part. Um, you know, it turned out nicely in his case, but it didn't have that many features to it. And it seemed to me like you can make it simply enough out of plastic, if you happen to have a 3D printer, which I do. So I figured I'd spend a bit of time doing the CAD and make the files for it and then print it off and make that available for other people to copy too. Now, he didn't uh, explain how this thing worked at all in his video, but let me demonstrate and then I will try to give you the rundown. This goes in the drill truck here. Then I have this wrench, which has a bit of a magnetic field to it because I went and magnetized it. Uh, but now if I put this down on the uh, workbench here, you can see it picks up all sorts of crap, right? And if I put it down on this plywood and drop the tool to it, You can see, now the wrench is clean, and if I put it down again, well, it picked up a little bit of stuff. Not as much as before. Let me try one more time, and see if we can get rid of a little bit of residual magnetic field too. Probably didn't do it for long enough. Alright, one more test. And there we go, all clean. This one here is a little bit small, so it doesn't work quite as fast. But anyway, you know, they work pretty well, and it's kind of cool, because it's magnets. The way this works is we have an array of magnets with flip-flopping poles. So north, south, north, south, etc., all the way around. And we put that in the drill press, or the mill, or whatever, and you spin it, that creates a very magnetic field with respect to anything sitting still on the plywood. Now here, with 12 magnets, that means it's flipping from north to south and back again six whole times on every rotation at 1000 RPM. <laughs> That's a very quickly varying magnetic field. And that can disrupt a stable magnetic field in something like this wrench, which you know gets magnetized when just floating around the shop. So, uh, some other features on this is that uh, it's got a half inch bolt for the shank. You know, no need to machine anything fancy for that. Just took a half inch bolt I'd laying around, cut the uh, threads off of it, and then made a hexagon shape on the end here to engage on the head of the bolt. Then the magnets here, like I said, there's 12 of them, and they're all 5 16th inch cylinders, uh, an eighth of an inch thick. So not very big magnets at all, but they still do the job. And you might notice the whole thing here is covered in some sort of schmoo. That's uh, super glue, and then a layer of baking soda on top. So I super glued in the magnets and then gave it a thin coat on top to help keep them in place. And the baking soda acts as a catalyst to make the uh, super glue cure faster and harder, kind of like an epoxy. And I sanded the whole thing flat on top just to make it kind of smooth. And the reason for that being, when it picks up, you know, crap around the shop, it's much easier to brush it off of a smooth surface than one that has a whole lot of, you know, little edges and gaps and stuff like that in it. So just makes your job for cleanup a little bit easier. I know you can use the winding from a shaded pole motor like this one here for both demagnetizing and magnetizing your tools. The uh, second of which you cannot do with this. But uh, I don't know. Overall, I'm just not that big of a fan. <laughs> I would probably like it more if I bothered to build a proper box for it and gave it a, you know, a real cord and a push button switch and all that jazz. But I never got around to it and, you know, just using it the way it is with a a cord hooked on to speed connectors just feels kind of janky and unsafe. 
And then on top of that, it's a pain in the ass to use because you gotta hold the tool in the right spot to make it work. And there's a, a limit on the size of the tool you can put in there with the uh, diameter of the hole. So, I don't know. It, it's a good trick to know. And it's actually another trick I learned from AVE in a video of his maybe like two or three years ago. Uh, I did try to find that one to also put in the description below, but I couldn't find it. So I'll, uh, I'll find some other one from somebody else and put that down there if, if you have not learned this trick before. Because it is good to know. It's good to know. But uh, I do like this one more. And in spite of how well this works, there's still one big improvement we can make. One weird thing I noticed about AVE's build was that his only had nine magnets. And when the poles are going flip, flop, flip, flop, you'd think having an odd number would mean at some point you'd have a flop and a flop beside each other. And that wouldn't work. Or rather, it would work, but not as well. Because <laughs> the goal is to have the field alternate, you know, as much as possible. And an even number would do that better. But, you know, AVE is a very smart guy. So it didn't make sense to me that he'd make an overset like that. You know, especially not in such an involved project. So I went through the comments and looked to see if anyone there had an explanation for it. And sure enough, someone else did ask the same question. You know, like, hey, why only nine? Why not 10 or even eight? And AVE himself did comment back and said rather cryptically <laughs> that it wasn't a flip-flop pattern, but rather a hallback array. Now, my degree was long enough ago that I've forgotten everything I learned about hallback arrays. But I did remember the term and remembered enough of it that I can go on Wikipedia and look it up and refresh my memory. And to be honest, I'm still a little bit unsure about how it applies in his case, but I get the gist of it well enough, we can still apply it here and get something way more powerful. This is one type of hallback array. First, I'll demonstrate why this is special, and then I'll try to explain. So this here will pick up the wrench. Not much force to it, but it will pick it up. If I flip it over 180, You see how much stronger that is? That is just a lot more force, right? From way up here, it'll still pick it up. Again, compare that, the strong side, to the weak side, where it barely picks it up at all. So how exactly does this work? Well, here we have a set of nine cube magnets and a bag to help keep the uh, garbage off of them. <laughs> but uh, they're polarized you know, between the faces. Not the front ones here, not the back ones, but uh, some of the inside faces. So say where this black line is, it's the one beside it that's the polarized face. And we'll say that's uh, north and then it's over south. So here we have south, north, north, south, north, south, north, south, okay? And then that goes all the way down, if I can keep this in frame. Yeah. <laughs> now, well, what that effectively gives us is one big north pole here, and then one big south pole here, another big north pole, and another big south pole. And that ends up concentrating the uh, strength magnetic field. So you get a much larger peak-to-peak -peak value between the north and the south. You also get fewer transitions because, you know, now you only have, uh, you know, two north poles and two south poles on here, as opposed to having eight transitions if you just flip-flopped. But they're much stronger transitions, which can still be very useful if you put it in one of those demagnetizing tools. And meanwhile, on the bottom of it here, we have a, a south and a north, and another south and another north. And the way this geometry works, it basically cancels out all the field. And that's why one side ends up being so weak, and one side ends up being so strong. Now, if you want to uh, you know, test out your own like this, I will uh, forewarn you, these magnets don't like being in this orientation, right? The little plastic case holding them in here is not just for show, it really is needed to hold them in place. Because, you know, like this magnet here desperately wants to pop out, turn around, and then force this one around too to have them all line up, you know, north to south, the way magnets normally do. So just don't be surprised if you try to make one of these and it fights you every bit of the way. But with this printed here, which I'll also upload in Thingiverse, you can try that out. And we can put the same thing in one of these. These two hallback arrays are the same basic geometry. The difference is we added a few more magnets here and gave it a gentle bend to form a loop. So this one is nine magnets in a row. And this one is 16 with a 22.5 degree offset. Now, is that little wedge ideal? No, <laughs> ideal would be machining every magnet so they fit together perfectly 
face to face. But that is a lot more effort for no practical gain. Because what we have here is still definitely a very strong side and a very weak side. It is definitely still a very effective hallback array. And the orientation of the magnets is again, just as you saw there, the difference, the only difference there being that this face is the magnetic face. So we have a black dot in the middle, that's the uh, north face pointing out towards the camera. Where it's silver, that's the south face pointing towards the camera. And where it's black dots on the edges, that's the north faces pointing in and the south faces pointing out. And just like with that one, don't be surprised if the magnets fight you as you try to put this together. So I did this starting with the sideways facing magnets and putting all of them in. And once the glue had set for them, I came back into the up and down facing magnets. That was probably a mistake because the up and down ones will fight you more as you try to shove them in the array. I probably had an easier time if I glued those ones in first and then come back to do the sideways ones. But in either case, do expect to use you know, a good amount of super glue and then still have to coat the thing on top with that and the baking soda to really epoxy it in there and hopefully make it durable. And you can even see on this one here, there's a few places where my uh, rubber gloves got stuck and peeled off in bits. But, you know, what do you do? In any case, this definitely does work. It's definitely way stronger than the other one. Uh, and you can build which other, whichever one you like more. When I said that AV's comment left me a little bit confused, here's why. On this one, it's pretty obvious how we orient the magnets to concentrate the field, because these magnets are cubes. So there's a few discrete and rather obvious orientations. And they can make square holes for them because we're working on a printer. And for filament extrusion, a square hole is just not a problem. If instead we were drilling holes on either a drill press or a mill and using cylindrical magnets, then there's only two obvious orientations, you know, just flip and flop. So I'm not sure you get the proper tumbling effect to create a Halbeck array, right? Then again, his magnets might have been, you know, polarized across the diameter as opposed to along the axis. I really don't know. So if you do happen to understand, uh, I'd really appreciate you commenting just because I'm simply curious. But in either case, uh, both of these do work, and I'm pretty happy with them both, and the idea is simply cool, because magnets. All right, a few quick thoughts, and then I'm done. Firstly, put something non-magnetic on top of the cast iron drill press table. A piece of plywood works fine. Uh, secondly, use the depth gauge on the side of your drill press to set a hard stop on how far down this goes. You want to make sure there's always a gap there, and that way you have a place to put the tool. If you don't do that, you might slam this thing into your tool at 1,000 RPM, and that would be no good. Uh, next up, general magnet safety. You know, do be careful, especially with the big ones, because they can slam together pretty hard and either break the magnet or pinch you, and that's just not a fun time. Uh, don't eat magnets. Magnets are not a snack. Uh, if you have any little nephews, you might know about that one. <laughs> uh, you know, be careful in the sensitive stuff, too. Computers or whatever. Uh, in the off chance you're curious, this watch here has been broken for years, and it was the cheapest one they had at Costco, so it is purely decoration. Uh, I do not care about it at all. <laughs> um, see, these parts here were made with FreeCAD, which is open source CAD software available to anyone for free. Uh, I also use CAD Query, which is a Python library for making things in FreeCAD with Python scripts. So I wrote code to make these parts, and that's why I can easily change it from having round holes to square holes with just updating a line of code. So if you want to see how that's done, the code for that will be on GitHub. I also put a few pre-made versions of this thing on Thingiverse. You can simply download and print. If what's on there is not what you want to print, then again, the code is on GitHub. <laughs> uh, let's see. In the likely event you are watching this on Thingiverse right now, you may want to take a minute and check out my channel too, because I do have a few other videos on there, either for other stuff uh, from printing or for the CNC project behind me right now that I'm currently bumbling through. Uh, I might not be the most entertaining guy on YouTube, but I do try to be uh, informative and interesting at the least. In any case, thanks for watching.